Just arrived in 1930, he called for full disarmament, and suggested that if 2% of the military refused to serve, disarmament would follow. Each visit was a platform for internationalism, socialism, civil rights, and disarmament. The public tolerated it all. A legend was growing around him. There was the story, he asked Chaplin, what does all this adulation mean? Chaplin replied, nothing. But Einstein had learned how to use his public images with effect. <laughs> Behind the scenes, academic politics were at play. When he left in 1932, Caltech, Oxford in England, Princeton were all courting him with permanent appointments. Einstein was undecided. Events were soon to force the issue. The leaders of Europe had debated disarmament for three years, hoping to spend less on arms and relieve the depression. It was a last chance for the League of Nations. We believe that progressive disarmament will not only relieve the burdens now pressing so heavily upon the backs of our taxpayers, but progressive disarmament will make you, will make us more secure in international peace. Einstein was outraged. This is not a comedy. It is the greatest tragedy of modern times, despite the cap and bells and buffoonery. We should be standing on rooftops denouncing this as a travesty. If you want peace, we shall ask the workers to refuse to manufacture and transport military weapons and to refuse to serve in the military. Governments could go on talking from now to doomsday. We must prevent the destruction of Western civilization. That summer in Berlin saw the last days of a culture that had bridged the 19th and 20th centuries. To those born before the Great War, there was the security of the things from out of their past. The atmosphere of gracious ideas, the civilized ways. It seemed comfort enough against the future. The Nazis were now the political force of Germany, controlling the streets and poles. That summer, Einstein finally agreed to spend part of each year at a new institute for research at Princeton. When he left for his visit that year, he knew that he was leaving his home forever. He called himself a bird of passage. Across the Atlantic, the Nazis came to power. Einstein's house in Kaput searched, confiscated. His colleagues in the Prussian Academy forced his resignation. The events demonstrated to Einstein the failure of international order. Now there was a conflict in his mind. Could a pacifist commit himself to a military struggle against fascism? At a 54th birthday dinner in New York, he had spoken English for the first time in public. Dear friend, I was so covered with flour that it is very difficult for me to bring to you my humble words. But I do it in German. The Bedeutung der Jerusalemer Universität für das jüdische Volk. Jerusalem University has particular meaning now. Jews in Europe are being extensively denied access to education and the professions. Over the years, I have read and heard much of this sorrow. It is not easy to say where the western boundaries of Europe are to be found. Einstein made one more trip to England that summer. He went into seclusion. The Nazis put a price on his head. 
In London, he made a last speech to Europeans before he left for Princeton. His personal despair for mankind was apparent. I am glad that you have me given the opportunity of expressing to you here my deep sense of gratitude as a man, as a good European, and as a Jew. I should like to give expression to an idea which occurred to me recently. Man, like every other animal, is passive by nature. Unless goaded by circumstance, he scarcely takes the trouble to reflect upon his condition and tends to behave as mechanically as an automaton. As a child and a young man, I passed through such a phase. One thought only of the trivialities of one's personal existence strove to talk and act like one's fellow. There are forces at work which seek to destroy the European heritage of freedom, tolerance, and human dignity. Fascism, nationalism, militarism, and communism, while constituting diverse political institutions, all lead to the subjugation and enslavement of the individual by the state and put an end to tolerance and personal liberty. Individualism, the recognized basis of European civilization, is more seriously threatened by the military organization of countries than anything else. But war is not a parlor game to be played according to definite rules. In London, Einstein also had spoken about places, even in our modern society, where the creative mind could pursue pure thinking. The Institute for Advanced Studies became that place for the remainder of his life. Here he continued a lonely search for a unified field theory, one which would link the physics of particles with the physics of space. A hallmark of Newtonian particle theories was action at a distance. However, this did not suit Einstein because theories of action at a distance, he felt, could not describe the raw experience of daily life because occurrences in the world in which we live occur not by action at a distance, but by touch. And since in Einstein's view, science is a development of pre-scientific thought, then the best scientific theory is a field theory. However, neither special nor general relativity theory removed the disturbing dualism of particle and field. That is, both particles and fields existed side by side. So it was natural that Einstein's next step after the general relativity theory was to attempt formulating a unified field theory which could describe the electromagnetic and the gravitational field and out of which particles would emerge as knots in space-time. Later in his life, one of Einstein's colleagues asked him why he wasted his talents looking for a unified field theory. After all, by the late 1940s, it was known that there were more fields than just the gravitational field and the electromagnetic field. To which Einstein answered, well, it's good for somebody like me to look for a theory of that type because a younger man has to establish his reputation and cannot afford the time. And besides, perhaps we can learn something new from just this even restricted line of research. But he was still tied to the political realities of American science. Refugees from fascism, like Einstein himself, were pouring in. By 1940, 100 scientists. In isolationist America, Einstein spoke out for the oppressed of Europe. The effect upon all nations, and not least upon the Germans, of the fate of these innocent people, so mal maliciously persecuted, must not be underestimated. To leave these victims to their misery would be a heavy blow to all those who believe in human solidarity and would encourage those who believe only in force and oppression and who act accordingly. The refugee scientists could not easily find jobs. Funding had dried up in the Depression, with the argument that science should be used for social engineering, not for proving relativity. Big physics and technology still attracted some money, such as the Palomar telescope. Scientists like Millikan lobbied hard, arguing that the natural sciences would pay off in the end. Frustrated, Millikan approached the army for help. 
Einstein, who was actively opposing Franco in Spain, was sympathetic. There was a common cause and argument, the defeat of the Nazis. The New York World's Fair of 1939 was a showcase for the promise of science and technology. Although the government had not yet seen the light, the public was fascinated with the world of the future, the possibility of atomic power. Einstein was there to dedicate the Jewish pavilion, appealing again for aid for refugees. A war was beginning in Europe. A drama of equal magnitude was taking place in a laboratory in Berlin. Hahn and Strassmann in Berlin had discovered that the splitting of the atom released a tremendous energy. An atomic bomb might be possible. Their findings were rushed into print in early 1939. What happened then is one of the first legends of the atomic age, here reenacted after the war by the scientists themselves. The news was rushed to a physics conference in Washington. Leo Siard, another refugee, brought the information personally to Einstein, along with a draft letter to the president. They told Roosevelt that an atomic bomb was feasible for both the United States and Hitler. Links should be built between the government and American physics, they wrote. The government should fund a research effort. This was Einstein's last direct contact with the Manhattan Project, the building of the bomb. The irony was bitter for Einstein, the pacifist. 6,000 was invested by the government initially. By 1945, nearly two billion. The effort involved the physics community as a whole, including the elite theorists who had come to America as refugees. During the war, he worked with the Navy on explosives. He was approached about a problem relevant to the bomb. But when he sought more information, the files indicate that his history prevented him being given every confidence, a security risk. A new and powerful relationship between science and government was emerging. The development of science and creative activities requires freedom, independence of thought from the restrictions of authoritarian and social prejudices. Theoretically, there is no authority whose decisions and statements can claim to be the truth. Is that time forever past when, aroused by his inner freedom and the independence of his thinking and his work, the scientist had the opportunity of enlightening and enriching the lives of his fellow human beings? Has he not forgotten about his responsibility and dignity as a scientist? As the possibility of the bomb became a reality in early 1945, scientists at Los Alamos and Oak Ridge began to express doubts about its uses. In June, the Franck report warned that if the bomb were used on Japan, international control afterwards would be impossible. An arms race inevitably would follow. But the bomb was dropped. National interests prevailed. The atomic bomb is too dangerous to be loose in a lawless world. That is why Great Britain, Canada, and the United States, who have the secret of its production, do not intend to reveal the secret until means have been found to control the bomb so as to protect ourselves and the rest of the world from the danger of total destruction. I shall ask Congress to cooperate to the end that its production and use be controlled and that its power be made an overwhelming influence toward world peace. Many scientists saw world peace as springing from a free exchange of information, the old ideal of international science. They began a program of public education and political lobbying. The proposed atomic legislation would have put nuclear development in the hands of the military under rigid security. The War Department will always have a vital interest in the use of atomic energy for military purposes. Despite the efforts of the military, represented by General Groves, head of the Manhattan Project, the scientists helped defeat the bill. A compromise, the McMahon Bill, created a Civilian Atomic Energy Commission, composed of government, the scientists, and the military. A new group was formed, the Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, 
with Einstein as chairman. Once again, they appealed for direct international control of atomic power and launched a program of public education. Einstein was more militant than others. In the winter of 1945, he had outlined what was to be his position over the coming years, world government and supranational authority over the military. He argued for freedom of scientific research and in the Atlantic Monthly article, remained skeptical of the potential of atomic energy. To give any estimate of when atomic energy can be applied to constructive purposes is impossible. What now is known is only how to use a fairly large quantity of uranium. The use of quantities sufficiently small to operate, say, in a car or an airplane, is as yet impossible. So, though the release of atomic energy can be, and no doubt will be, a great boon to mankind, that may not be for some time. An American plan was proposed for international control of materials, but the United States to retain vital information on atomic bombs. And Einstein's committee rejected it. And as the Russians were considering the plan, the first post-war test at Bikini took place. Now the Soviets vetoed the plan. Cold War politics had taken over. The crusade of the scientists had failed. In Washington, there was increasing concern for secrecy. America clashed with the Soviet Union over Eastern Europe. There was espionage, rumors of espionage. The House on American Activities Committee investigated American loyalties. The Truman Loyalty Oath was created for civil servants, scientists on government work included. And now so much research was for the government. Scientists were seen as weak links in atomic secrets. Over 150,000 were investigated. Now Einstein saw another imperative, academic freedom. With universal order should come universal freedom. On this, confidence and loyalty would flourish. But the existence of the bomb created dangers in the hearts of men, he said. He made one of his rare public appearances at the 1947 Princeton commencement. Truman was the guest speaker. Universal training represents the most democratic, the most economical, and the most effective method of maintaining the military strength we need. It is the only way that such strength can be achieved without imposing a ruinous burden on our economy through the maintenance of a large standing armed force. We must remember above all that these young men would be training in order not to win a war, but in order to prevent one. The Cold War escalated. Soviet and American challenge and response. Einstein wrote, political rhetoric is taking on a life of its own. The Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, linked to one world movements, lost credibility in the public eye magic of the atomic scientist was tarnished. For some elite scientists, such as Niels Bohr, international ideals were preserved through UNESCO with its programs for international development of atomic power. Science flourished, but the context had changed. Before the war, government funding of basic research was obtained only with difficulty, a few million dollars. Now, the linked government and military interests provided a billion dollars for research and development. It was the payoff sought in the 1930s. There was a certain inevitability in this. In the fall of 1949, the public learned that there were other bombs in the world. In January 1950, the announcement was made that America would develop a super bomb the H-bomb. Einstein had been ill, a heart problem dating from 1928. He had continued his work toward a unified field theory alone, but he had not lived as a recluse at Princeton. Since 1945, he had worked actively for his ideals. Now Einstein was offered a new medium to speak to the public. A televised response to the H-bomb decision had been organized by Eleanor Roosevelt. 
At 70, he spoke with the same idealism as in his youth. The armament race between the USA and USSR originally supposed to be a preventive measure assumes hysterical character. On both sides, the means to mass destruction are perfected with feverish haste behind the respective walls of secrecy. The hydrogen bomb appears on the public horizon as a probably attainable goal. Its accelerated development has been solvented. If successful, radioactive poisoning of the atmosphere and hence annihilation of any life on Earth has been brought within the range of technical possibilities. The ghost-like character of this development lies in its, in its apparently compulsory trend. Every step appears as the unavoidable consequence of the preceding one. In the end, there beacons more and more clearly general annihilation. Is there any way out of this impasse created by man himself? All of us, and particularly those who are responsible for the attitude of the US and the USSR, should realize that we may have vanquished an external enemy, but have been incapable of getting rid of the mentality created by war. It is to achieve peace as long as every single action is taken with a possible future conflict in view. The leading point of view of all political action should therefore be, what can we do to bring about a peaceful coexistence and even a loyal cooperation of the nations? The first problem is to do away with mutual fear and distress. Solemn renunciation of violence, not only with respect to means of mass destruction, is undoubtedly necessary. In the last analysis, every kind of peaceful cooperation among men is primarily based on mutual trust, and only secondly on institutions like courts of justice and police. This holds for nations as well as for individuals. And the basis of trust is loyal give and take. Einstein brought his ideals to America. He took only what he needed out of the American dream. A simple house on Mercer Street was never a barrier to the outside world. Over the years, the public somehow accepted two Einsteins. One was the advocate of unpopular causes. The other, here offered the presidency of Israel, the most famous living scientist. In 1954, an amateur astronomer, Zvi Gazari, visited Einstein. His nine-year-old son made these home movies. Einstein told him this story. When I was young, I wanted a telescope, but I've never been able to buy one because then it would become commercialized. So Gazzari built one for him. Einstein admired Gazzari because he could not himself build one with his own hands. Yet on his work was built theories of the universe. All right, but can we all stand all right. up then? All all right. Right. One of his last public appearances was to dedicate the Albert Einstein Medical College in New York. I am grateful that Yeshiva University has honored me by using my name in connection with the new College of Medicine. There is a shortage of physicians in this country and there are many young people able and eager to study medicine who under present circumstances are deprived of the opportunity to do so. Shortly before, his old friend from the Bern days, Besso, 
had died. Einstein wrote, this death signifies nothing. For us believing physicists, the distinction between past, present, and future is only an illusion, even if a stubborn one. Einstein, would you look this way, please? That's it. And over here, Doctor, if you please. Thank you. 